Want to take a break from scrolling through your social media? Well, here's a fun, I mean fun, way to pass the time while keeping your brain engaged. It's Best Fiends. It's a casual game that anyone can play, and honestly, it's a real grabber. With interesting storylines and challenging puzzles, it will only take you a moment to download it and quickly get started watching the bugs and slugs fight it out. Best Fiends. I mean, there have been 100 million downloads of this game globally, so clearly it's a winner. Again, you can download it free on the Apple App Store or Google Play, where it sports a five-star rating for mobile puzzle games. It will most definitely engage your brain as you ponder those puzzles and collect tons of appealing characters. That's Best Fiends. That's Friends, but without the R. The biggest astronomy story of the last two decades is that the universe is studded with planets. By the time we retired the Kepler Space Telescope in 2018, we had learned that planets orbiting other stars are frankly quite common. Now two astronomers who were the first to detect an extrasolar planet have been awarded the highest prize in physics. Uh, grab your coat. I hear Stockholm is kind of chilly in December. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. This is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute. And in this episode, why the discovery of an exoplanet garnered the Nobel Prize in physics, and how our subsequent discoveries of planets around other suns strengthens the odds that we could find life elsewhere. The big question, could we detect it, though? Plus, how exoplanet chemistry inspires this composer. It's Nobel Efforts. This planet, about 50 light years away, hostile to life and disagreeable overall, is an unlikely celebrity, it's true. Well, it's not a planet that you'd want to visit on vacation. It's a gas giant planet similar to Jupiter. That means that if you fell into it, you'd keep on going. And what's even worse is that it's very close to its star. In fact, if you were there, you'd probably be boiled like a lobster. Nevertheless, the planet 51 Pegasus b is historic. Its existence revealed itself to a pair of Swiss astronomers more than two decades ago, and that fact prompted Sweden's Nobel Prize Committee to hand Michel Mayor and Didier Kilos their coveted physics award. Now, in a moment, we'll hear how the discovery of more than 4,100 exoplanets has transformed the hunt for life beyond Earth. But first, a few more words about how the Nobel Prize-winning discovery was made from an expert that we've invited into the studio. Yeah, well, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm an eighth-rung expert, <laughs> but, but this was, of course, big news back in 1995. I mean, there was a whole history before that of looking for exoplanets going back decades and decades. I mean, there are people who are trying various uh, techniques to try and find exoplanets, and almost all of them claimed that they had found them. Do you remember when the announcement was made back in 1995? Yes, I very much remember it. And it was, it was you know, it was big news. Now, in 1993, there was also some big news when it comes to exoplanets because uh, a guy by the name of Alex Walshon at Penn State, in fact, had discovered planets around a pulsar, two of them, maybe three, okay? And he'd done that by just measuring the timing of the pulsar, so th that the pulsar was clearly moving back and forth. And that's what he found, and that was moving back and forth because of these planets. And pretty much the same technique has been used by doctors Mayor and Kilos when they measured the back and forth wobble of uh, 51 peg and found it had a planet. So indeed, this is called the the wobble method. Yes. <laughs> the wobble method in astronomy. And the idea is that the planet has a gravitational pull on its star, and that um, causes the light to wobble back and forth? Well, the light doesn't wobble, but the, the, the star does. You see, the fundamental problem is this, that the planets are very small compared to stars, and they're very dim compared to stars. So it's very hard to see them directly. So you have to think of a way to find them on the basis of their influence on something else, and in this case, on their stars. Now, you know, you think of planets going around stars and the star's just sitting there and the planet's orbiting it, but that's not quite right. What actually happens is they both orbit a, a what's called a common center of mass there. So they're both moving a little bit. The star not very much, the planet quite a bit, right? And, you know, the sun moves back and forth about an inch or inch and a half because of the orbiting Earth. Well, it turns out 
that if you look at that star with what's called a spectroscope and, you know, break up the light from it, you can measure very, very subtle motions of that star, subtle enough to see the influence of a planet that's orbiting it. Now, the technology has changed for detecting exoplanets, so we'll hear more about that later. There's now something called the, the transiting method for detecting exoplanets. Just in, in one line, what is that? Yeah, well, that's, that's indeed a different idea altogether, where you just look at a star, you stare at it for as long as you can with a telescope, and you just keep measuring its brightness. And if you happen to luck out and there's a planet orbiting it that occasionally gets in front of the star, right, the way Venus gets in front of the sun occasionally for us, well, then that'll dim the star a very small amount, you know, a part in 10,000, 1,000, something like that. And if you can measure that dip, you can say, you know, there's something orbiting that star, and it's probably a planet. So there's the wobble method and there's the dimming method. Well, that gives us an idea of how the technology is being used to discover these planets. These are planets outside our solar system. They have their own star <laughs> that they're busy with. They're orbiting their own star, not ours. Scientists are very excited about this for many reasons, and now we will get some perspective on just what some of those reasons are. My name is Roy Gould. I'm trained as a biophysicist, and I'm an education analyst at the Center for Astrophysics, which is jointly run by Harvard and the Smithsonian. I heard Dr. Gould give his talk on exoplanets while in Somerville, Massachusetts, just 48 hours before the morning news broke that heralded the names of the winners of the Nobel Prize in Physics. So I contacted him for an interview. Roy, you gave a talk here in Somerville about the significance of exoplanet discovery just two days before the Nobel Committee announced that the Nobel Prize in Physics had gone to the astronomers who first discovered an exoplanet. That seems strangely prescient. Did you have a feeling it was coming? <laughs> well, I think everyone knew it was coming, but they didn't know when. That's always the case with Nobel Prizes. In your opinion, is this discovery worthy of the highest honor in science? And then let me ask something else. Did they win because of the discovery of this planet, 51 Pegasus B, or because it sort of broke the dam for the hundreds, now thousands, of exoplanet discoveries that followed? Both, I think. I think they deserved this prize because they answered a question that people have been asking for thousands of years. Are there other worlds out there? And when they made this discovery, we knew the answer was yes. There's at least one other world beside our own solar system that's out there. But you're absolutely right. They really opened this floodgate of discovery. And I think that's why it's, it's really in retrospect that we realize how important the discovery is. The Nobel Prize is not awarded for being the greatest scientist or the most brilliant scientist or having the most clever experiment. This was a fairly straightforward experiment. And in their discovery paper, the authors said, well, um, the very first sentence was, we recognize there are other groups who are doing the same thing now. They happen to be the first, and that's always very important. Can you update us on the story? Because that was more than two decades ago, and the hunt for exoplanets has picked up a lot of speed. And in fact, you reported in your talk that we now believe there are exoplanets orbiting every star in the night sky. That seems like quite a claim. Will you put it in your words? You're nodding? Yes. Uh, yes. Essentially, every star on average in the, in the night sky has at least one planet orbiting it. And that's based, of course, we've discovered 4,000 exoplanets around almost as many stars. And that's a sample. And from that sample, we can extrapolate these large planets, which are, of course, are very hot because they're so close to their star. Those are the ones we found first. And people said, well, that's, that's wonderful. There are planets out there. But that's not what we really wanted to find. We wanted to find planets that are more like Earth. Does that mean that they are just like Earth or Earth-like? In what ways do they resemble Earth? They're rocky. They're rocky. And now there have been many Earth-sized planets that have been discovered. It's estimated that one in six of small red stars have at least one Earth-sized planet orbiting it. And of course, there's a reason we're looking for Earth-like planets. And that has to do with the role of exoplanets in the hunt for life beyond Earth. Yes. I think the excitement in the field is twofold. First of all, I think people are very excited in looking at the diversity of planets themselves. In other words, even if no other planet had life, 
there's something really amazing about the diversity of planets that we're finding. There are planets that are darker than anything we know, darker than coal. There are planets that appear to be almost entirely water. I used to call them ocean worlds, but they're actually too hot to be ocean worlds. They're, it's, they're sauna worlds because that water is steam. There are planets where it rains glass <laughs> because the sand and the silicon is uh, vaporized, and when it gets to high altitude, it just rains back down. Planets where there are winds of 5,000 miles an hour. There are planets that have two stars in the sky, so they have two sunsets. Like in the scene from Star Wars. Exactly. The planet Tatooine was science fiction before astronomers actually discovered it. Oh, yes, there are. And many astronomers thought, well, you couldn't really have planets around these double stars because the gravity would be unusual and it would be difficult for planets to form. Now we find that it's not uncommon to have double stars that have planets orbiting them. That's that's not uncommon. You said that there are two reasons why people are very excited. There are probably more, but there are at least yes. two main reasons why people are very excited about uh, the discovery of these exoplanets. You are one of those people. Tell us what it means for the hunt for life beyond Earth. Well, tremendously exciting, and it absolutely raises the possibility of it. And I think no one really wanted to go on the record about this before, but you know, now astronomers all assume that there's the universe is really teeming with life because there are so many planets. There are something like a billion Earth-sized planets out there in our galaxy alone. Now, of course, most of those are so far away that we don't really have a hope of studying them or communicating with them. But even just within range of our instruments, the ones that we have now and the ones that are being built, there are still dozens and hundreds, actually, of Earth-sized planets. I want to put you on the spot a bit. Can I do that? Sure. Do you think the universe is teeming with life? Are you one of those scientists who's willing to go on the record and say that it is? Yes. I Well, <laughs> well yes. Yes. I think the universe is teeming with life. Whether it's teeming with civilizations or not is a very important, and it's another question. But... I think it is teeming with life for many reasons. The numbers of planets certainly tell us that that increases the likelihood of finding life because before we didn't know if there were any other planets. And we know, for example, that the conditions for life are probably the, not just having lots of planets, but actually having planets that welcome life. Those conditions are probably very, very common. For example, take Jupiter, you know, Jupiter, gas giant planet, you don't want to visit it, but its moon, Europa, is covered with a surface of ice. Astronomers always say, if you want to find life, follow the water. Well, Europa is covered with a surface of ice, and under that ice we know now is an ocean of liquid salt water, and it's about 62 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about the temperature of the water off Bermuda. Now, I've noticed that you switched from using what I think to what other people think, what other scientists think, and you've made a really good case as to why there may be life elsewhere. But I'm wondering why you think there is. You said that you think that the universe is teeming with life. And is it for the reasons you just laid out? Or does it have to do with another idea that in some ways that the, and this is something you've written about, that the universe seems to work hard to create order out of chaos. So are there other reasons besides the discovery of these exoplanets and what that means, why you think there may be life elsewhere? Yes. No, I, I think more than just the numbers and, and even beyond the conditions uh, for life that we might find here in our own solar system on moons of Jupiter and so forth, even beyond that, what we're learning now about life itself, I think, tells us that there is something really special about life. I'm actually surprised that many physicists still have the view that somehow life is kind of just a question of chance and so forth, because obviously mutations are chance and chance does affect evolution. But everything that we're learning now actually points in the opposite direction. In fact, even at the Smithsonian, we have a program that's called Is Evolution Predictable? because we found that many life forms have evolved in parallel to have the same behaviors or the same structures. For example, uh, tuna fish and sharks haven't had a common ancestor for 40 million years, and yet they both evolved very specialized ways of swimming. They're unlike other fish, and in the case of sharks, it goes way back. And that used to be considered rare, and now we see that evolution takes us in a direction towards the same kinds of solutions given the same environment. So if we 
do find the same environments out there, we would expect to find creatures that are not that unlike us. I like to say that we will not find life. We'll find evidence for life. And some people are disappointed by that. I find it actually thrilling because it says that this is a detective story that's going to be ongoing. I think many of us are hoping to find evidence for life really even in the next five or ten years because our instruments will be good enough by then. But that, of course, is not the same as finding life. Well, Roy, if we were to discover life elsewhere in the universe, whether it be a microbe or... In fact, I don't want to put down microbes, okay? So it could be a microbe <laughs> or it could be a in, in more intelligent, more advanced life. How would the story of the universe change? As the late physicist Philip Morrison once put it, one example of life is a miracle. Two examples is a statistic. And I think absolutely it would change our view of the universe because, you know, we're in a lonely world out here on Earth. And to find life on another planet, even just evidence for life, even if it's microbial life, is telling us that life finds a way, as others have said. Life just finds a way. Anybody who weeds their backyard and keeps pulling them out and sees them popping back up understands that at a visceral level. And I think this would send a message to all of us that life is out there. Ironically, I think it will tell us that life is more precious than we give it credit for, because then we'd want to know, well, yes, there's life, but why isn't there life like us? Are we the new kids on the block? Are we the new kids in the neighborhood? Are we precocious? Or do civilizations not last very long? Or are there other reasons? Maybe the universe is teeming with intelligent life, but they just don't want to talk to us or they have nothing to say. But I think we would find that out very quickly after we find the first example of life out there. Would the discovery of life on another planet be um, a candidate for a Nobel Prize? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. In what category? <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. I'm not sure. Well, they'd have to have a new category. There is not one for biology, is there? But there is one for, for chemistry. Well, there's one for medicine. So, and that's biology fits into and medicine. physics. And physics. Maybe yes. it would be for peace. For, <laughs> Depen yes. <laughs> depending on what happens next. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really wonderful. Roy Gould, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Roy Gould is a researcher at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I really enjoyed his description of the, the variety of, of exoplanets. I mean, when you think of planets, you think of the planets in our own solar system. But, you know, there, there, there are many more kinds of planets. I mean, he talked about dark planets and water worlds and so forth. The view from other planets would make Earth an exoplanet. Right? Well, that's true, but... And, yes. if you, and if you looked at Earth and you saw how much water you might think that it's a watery world because really we have more water, we have more ocean than we do land. You know, as people say, we should be calling Earth ocean rather than identifying it by its terrestrial composition. Yeah, but that's two syllables instead of one. But you're right, uh, two-thirds of the surface of the Earth is underwater. Yes, but on the other hand, I have to say that if you're looking for life elsewhere, you know, and you only consider planets that don't have any land surface, they're all completely underwater, you know, I mean, does that mean that they never develop intelligence, or is all the intelligence, you know, like dolphins and whales, it's all underwater and it's not smelting steel or building radio transmitters or, you know, watching television? Well, the hunt for exoplanets is now one of the most exciting areas of astronomical research, and NASA's newest exoplanet hunter, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, is currently busy looking at the nearest stars for planets. But are the planets that it finds the right planets to look at in the hunt for life? And by the way, how do we know that they have life even if we do find them? Well, that's next. It's Nobel Efforts on Big Picture Science.
there's more than one way to unveil an exoplanet. I mean, you've got your wobble method that the now Nobel laureated astronomers used, but in fact, most of the exoplanets have been found using the transit method. The most recent example of this approach, TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It is studying an area of the sky that is 400 times larger than the mission that preceded it, that of the Kepler Space Telescope, as it looks for candidates for life. My name is Jeff Smith. I work at the SETI Institute at NASA Ames Research Center, and I work on TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, and my job is to develop the data processing pipeline that goes from the raw data to the planet discovery. Jeff, Tess, it's already up there, right? It is. And uh, it's looking for nearby planets, uh, exoplanets, but finding planets is nothing new. Yep. How will this experiment advance our search for life beyond mm. Earth? Yeah, well, everybody, I hope, has heard of the Kepler mission by now, and that's been a resounding success. It's discovered thousands of planets. The problem is those planets are mainly very far away, and so it's very difficult to do follow-up analysis, measure the mass of the planets, or maybe even the atmosphere of those planets, whereas TESS is searching for planets that are much closer in, a mere tens of light years away. And in that case, it's close enough that you can use like ground-based measurements or other space-based instruments to characterize these planets, measure its mass, and measure atmospheres, maybe biosignatures in these planets. Okay, so Kepler, the typical distance for a planet found yeah. by Kepler might be, what, a thousand light years? Thousands to nine thousand light years. I think it got out to about that far, but yeah, thousands of light years. Okay, yeah, so, so but it, TESS can look at planets that might be, you know, five light years yeah, away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's looking at to just a dozen or so out to a couple hundred, and that's close enough that other instruments can actually do follow-up on this. So what you're saying is that the mission, should it choose to accept it, of <laughs> TESS is to go and find all the nearby planets? Ideally, sure, but the primary mission of TESS is to find 50 Earth-sized planets that are close enough that you can measure the mass of them. And so, but of course, we're going to find many more than that, and we already are finding a lot of planets. So, but yeah, whatever we can find close in that we can do follow-up analysis is is good. We're talking about finding small planets, sort of mm -hmm. like the Earth, because one presumes those are the kind of planets that might have atmospheres and right. oceans and, you know, some biology. Mm -hmm. But those are the hardest kind of planets to find, right? The smaller the planet is, generally speaking, the more difficult it is to find. That's true. I mean, the, the first planets that were discovered were giant planets, jupiter size, or maybe even bigger. And so there might be life around planets like that, but we know there's life around a planet that's about the Earth's size, so we're trying to find things kind of like that. You know, if we have one data point where life is. So we're searching around that one data point. And so we're predominantly searching for planets that are about the size of the Earth to maybe up to four times the radius of the Earth. However, even at that point, it's questionable as to you know, how Earth-like a planet like that would be. That'd be Neptune but size. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that would, it would be about Neptune size. And so Neptune isn't quite like the Earth. <laughs> Ideally, we would even search for things even smaller than the Earth or even more difficult. So officially for tests, we say between one and four Earth radii. So you couldn't find for. Mars, for example. Well, I mean, it a would Mars be around another star. It would be difficult. I mean, Kepler found a Martian, a Mars-like planet, and it would be difficult for tests to due to its sensitivity to find something that small. But, you know, maybe possibly. Okay. Now, you mentioned Martians. I think that was mm -hmm. probably, a, probably a slip. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But TESS isn't actually looking for life. It's looking for planets. Yeah, exactly. All TESS can directly measure is the size of the planet and its orbital period, and hence how far it is away from the host star that it's orbiting. We would love to find, you know, evidence of life around these planets, but TESS can't do it on its own. TESS is just searching for these planets. Once we find interesting ones, we've got to do follow-up measurements using other instruments in order to actually see if there's any evidence of life on them. Well, let's let's consider that. I mean, the James Webb Telescope is mm -hmm. going up soon. I don't know what yeah. soon means. Well, maybe uh, maybe yeah. you know what soon Nobody means. Nobody knows exactly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> soon. <laughs> soon. It's kind of the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. But it has the horsepower, I presume, to look at some of these planets found by TESS yeah. and tell us what about them. Well, the biggest thing is the composition of its atmosphere. We want to find biosignatures of some sort in the atmosphere. Now, what is evidence of life in the atmosphere of a planet? We don't really know exactly. I mean, just because you see oxygen doesn't mean there's life there. But just if there's enough oxygen, then that's a strong indicator. Carbon dioxide in enough 
could possibly be a indicator, but you know, there's natural processes that generate that, likewise with methane. But yeah, something like the James Webb Space Telescope will able to you know measure the spectrum of these planets and see what is the composition of the atmosphere of these planets. But again, like I said, I don't think we're going to find confirmation of life. We're going to find hints of life, and it's going to be a while before the evidence grows and we say, ah, this really is life. So it's very possible in the near future the planets that Tess finds will start to find hints of life on these planets. Now, i got to ask, are you going, are you, you're, you're being cautious here. Yeah, well, I'm a scientist. So. Yes, yes, and also there's a kind of a track record here of being incautious, yeah. right? In the 1970s, the Viking landers plopped down onto Mars, yeah. and according to at least one of the scientists there, it found life, and according to everybody else, it didn't find life. Yeah. And so there's some ambiguity there. You're just sort of hedging your bets. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's uh, one scientist doesn't make science. You know, you need more than one to claim something before people believe it. You know, and I think that's a good thing. That's the scientific method. So uh, you need more than one source of evidence of life before you believe that there's life out there. Let's talk a little bit about how Tess is going to find these planets, the cousins of Earth, potentially, at mm -hmm. least. Or maybe maybe they're somebody else's cousins. The way Kepler worked, it is it uh, look for planets that got in front of their star and dimmed yeah. the star a little bit. Yeah. How, does, how does Tess work? Same thing. It's uh, you're just looking for the dimming of light coming from the star due to the planet orbiting and passing in front of it. And only if the planet passes between the host star and Tess will you actually see the dimming of light. So... For every planet we find, it's the same thing as Kepler. There's going to be hundreds out there for every one that we find. Now, for the type of planets we're looking at and the type of stars we're looking at, uh, mainly M dwarfs, the likelihood of alignment is better because we're looking for planets that are orbiting closer into the star. So uh, the lever arm isn't as big, and so there's more likelihood that some of the light of the star will be blocked. So the frequency of planets that we find around stars on tests will be higher than Kepler just due to the type of stars we're looking at. Okay, for those who don't know what an M dwarf is. Oh, sorry about well, that. Well, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just not, you know, somebody who pays attention to Snow White. An M dwarf is just a runty little star. Yeah, right? exactly. It's a, it's a dim, small star, and so therefore the amount of light given off is much less. So therefore the the habitable zone, the, the distance between the star and where the planet would be such that liquid water could potentially be on the surface, it's much closer in, and therefore the orbital period to be in the habitable zone is, instead of being like a year, is maybe only 14 days. Right. So you could have planets that are really whipping around. Exactly. And uh, their inhabitants could live to hundreds of years yep. of age because a year is only two weeks or something. So these M dwarf systems, yeah. if they're going to be habitable systems, if there's going to be a world in there with some sort of biology, mm -hmm. then those planets have to be close in simply because the stars are so dim. And, right. And they'd be too cold. It would be too cold. And no metabolism that we are aware of could be there. All right. So, Tess, it's up there now. Has it found any planets? Certainly. It's found lots of planets and lots of confirmed planets already, and it's already found planets that are roughly Earth size as well. So the total count right now, I can't recall, but it's in the dozens that are confirmed, maybe 60 or something like that. And there's lots of planet candidates. The pipeline that I develop generates a thousand or so planetary-like transit signals every month, and those have to be vetted and searched. And out of that, we get hundreds of possible planet candidates, which have to be continued to study, and then that's whittled down to the small number that can actually be confirmed, which is a difficult process. It takes a while. When you say confirmed, who does that? It's very difficult to confirm a planet using only test data, likewise with Kepler. In certain situations, you can show that the likelihood of a false positive signal is so small that, yeah, it's probably a planet. But in most cases, you have to have some independent measurement of some sort usually ground-based. It could be some other space-based measurement as well, but something to independently verify that a planet is really there and that the signal we're looking at really is coming from a planet, not due to the star itself or some background object. Uh, so in, any room for citizen science in any of this? I mean, certainly. could the public get involved? Yeah, well, the um, uh, there is a citizen science program to simply search for the transit signals, and that's something that the public is, is involved with. People can go online, planethunters.org, and you can search tests and Kepler signals and try to find transits in them. Okay, so I'm going to look for a year or two or three now, Jeff. Yeah. And uh, let's say that, you know, maybe uh, James Webb or some ground base gargantuan telescope follows mm -hmm. up on one of these test discoveries, yeah. and it finds a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere of a... Uh, 
an exoplanet or maybe even water vapor. Who knows right. what? What do you think the reaction is going to be to that? Is the public now all jaded uh, uh, by exoplanets? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> I think if a announcement came out saying that we found strong evidence of life in the atmosphere of some exoplanet, Boy, I would hope that that would actually make the news and people would be excited about that. I don't think people are jaded quite yet. So, Jeff, mm -hmm. uh, the two Swiss astronomers, Michel Mayor and Didier Quilos, they win the Nobel Prize for finding 51 Peg, the first planet around a normal star. Is the Nobel Prize still serving the interests of science, in your opinion? Well, in terms of publicizing great discoveries, yes, I think it serves science and humanity. I do question about picking one, two, or three individuals to represent an entire discovery since science is no longer performed by individual genuses. It's performed by an entire group of scientists and engineers. And to simply randomly pick a couple, you might say it's not random, but it's, I think it's in some ways misrepresentative of, again, the scientific endeavor. Jeff Smith, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you very much, Seth. Jeff Smith is a data scientist for the TESS mission and a principal investigator at the SETI Institute. We heard from Roy Gould earlier that he predicted we, and it's very hard to predict these things, but he thought we might find evidence of life within five years, as soon as five years. When you hear what the goals are of TESS and the way that the scientists are going about looking for habitable planets, do you think of that Roy Gould's prediction? that we may find life or evidence of life within five years is an outrageous one or a reasonable one. Well, I tell you, Molly, I'm going to enter it in my logbook here of predictions about when we're going to find life. Now, the first entry, I, I have to say unashamedly, is mine. But going back seven years, I said we'll find intelligent life within two dozen years. Okay. But three or four years ago, the chief scientist for NASA said that she figured we'd find life in the solar system within 20 years. Okay, now Roy Gould is saying we're going to find life within five years. Now, you know, some of these people might be right. Maybe they'll all be right. So his is the soonest. His he, is the soonest. Well, he's going out on the limb more than others, yes. You've made a lot of bets over the years that <laughs> we'll find life within 20 years. I mean, I guess every few years you say it'll be another 20 years. <laughs> well, so you get a lot of mileage out of that. And what do people get if they do discover life within those 20 years? What are you going to give them? I, I was talking about intelligent life. I think that's a better prize maybe than microbes, but, you know, my own bias. Yeah, well, I bet them all a cup of coffee. That's what I bet them. They make perhaps the most momentous discovery in the history of mankind, and they get a cup of coffee? Well, not the discoverers. Uh, it's, you know, anybody that I spoke to about this bet. See, that's why it's only a cup of coffee. I mean, it isn't just the uncertainty that this will happen, but it's the fact that there may be a lot of people for whom I have to buy coffee. You're going to have to open up a coffee shop. Yeah, well, uh, that's right. Look, the the real question is not so much my obligation to buy people hot beverages, but, you know, what would it mean? I mean, you know, to succeed would be very satisfying because it would at least vindicate the hopes and the efforts of all the people that, you know, are involved in doing these kinds of experiments. I mean, they're trying to do something. It's like, I don't know, finding the cure for a, a very deadly disease. You might work your entire career on it. And if you finally succeed, sure, there's the, the, the change to society because now we would know that there's life out there and we're just, you know, the, the earth is, is an interesting place, but there are other interesting places. All of that would be incredibly interesting. But it would also change everything from now on in some way. It isn't that, you know, people will all start getting along or anything like that, but at least we would, you know, have that knowledge. Let's face it, picking up the phone one day or one early morning in October and hearing a voice with a Swedish accent assuring you that the Nobel Committee had not, in fact, misdialed, well, that would certainly be music to a scientist's ears. But the discovery of exoplanets is helping to make music in other ways, too. To understand whether exoplanets could be habitable, we need to study their atmospheric chemistry. Of that idea, one composer is taking and making notes. Next. It's Nobel efforts on big picture science.
We're talking about how the discovery of exoplanets is changing our hunt for alien life. Now, the first confirmed discovery of a planet around another normal star has sent two astronomers to Stockholm. But the Nobel Prize Committee is not the only one inspired by the discovery of exoplanets. The composer David Ibbett has undertaken a project to sonify the chemical spectra data for exoplanets, that is, to turn their chemical signatures into sound. As we heard from Jeff Smith, follow-ups to the TESS mission will examine the light that passes through the atmospheres of possibly habitable exoplanets, and we'll do that by examining the rainbow of color you get when you break up the light that comes through their atmospheres using, for example, a prism. Doing so, you'll see that the rainbow is not continuous. There are places in that spectrum where the colors are gone because that light has been absorbed by various chemicals in the atmosphere. These absorption wavelengths reveal the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Different spectra indicate different chemicals. But David Ibbett wants us to use not our eyes, but another sense to depict the chemistry of planets. He's carrying out an experimental idea that some exoplanet hunters have proposed. Because our ears are fine-tuned instruments, they're able to detect tiny changes in a wide range of frequencies. For example, we can hear eight octaves of sound. That's the run of a piano keyboard. Finding a way to represent light waves as sound waves, well, that's an approach encouraged by Roy Gould, whom we heard from earlier. When he's not giving talks on exoplanets for the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, he too tickles the ivories. The science musician team of Dr. Gould and David Ibbett sat down with Molly in a recording studio in Somerville, Massachusetts. Well, we are here in the studio with a keyboard in front of us. It's a nice red keyboard for A me. nice red keyboard, and you're going to play at some point, David. Let's start with just a, a, a definition of what we're going to do here. Can you give us an overview of sonification? Why do we need it in our lives? Well, uh, why do we need it? It reveals things uh, that we can't easily perceive in another way. Uh, I mean, science is, is full of data, and uh, I always find that um, I, 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 I like graphs. You know, I I like uh, following the lines, and but scientists are always trying to hide that stuff and, and be direct. And I think that sonification can can really help with that. Sound is so immediate, and especially music and a musical chord is so immediate. You know, we we think about melodies and tunes, and we can recognize a tune even if it's covered by five different people in, in different arrangements. That's because we're hearing something other than just the the raw data. We're putting it into a different form, and I think that's what's exciting about what David's doing. We all have this hardwired ability to identify pitch, to identify notes, and uh, the relationships between those notes, which we call harmony. And uh, it can be incredibly complicated, and yet we pick up on it so immediately, far quicker than, say, seeing the same uh, data visually. Earlier you played for us all the octaves on the piano. Right. And is it true that our ears can detect eight octaves of sound, but we're very limited in the amount of visual data we can take in? Yeah, we have somewhere between eight and ten octaves that, that we can hear. Uh, ten would be the kind of absolute amazing, uh, very young ears. <laughs> as, a, as an adult, we've got somewhere around eight. But for, for light, we have this much narrower range of the spectrum that we can perceive. So it's much wider for sound, and that, that's useful when we're talking about um, data f from the electromagnetic spectrum, which is much wider. And of course, uh, light comes as waves, and music comes as sound waves. So and you can convert waves into waves. So, uh, you know, in a sense, nature is inviting us to convert from one form of waves to another. Let's hear how you sonified some of the, the spectrum from various planets, certain chemical signatures. And Roy, if you could just remind us how it is that we can tell anything about a planet by its chemical signature, in other words, by its light. Right. Well, normally we, we actually are observing the starlight that's coming past the planet and some of that starlight comes through the atmosphere of the planet, and the molecules that are in the atmosphere actually absorb some of the light. And so we can detect 
the colors of light that are absorbed by these molecules. I think molecules are a halfway to being musical instruments to begin with because mm. like a violin string, a molecule vibrates and rotates and resonates. And so we can see, oh, at what colors or frequencies or wavelengths do those molecules actually vibrate? And that's similar to what David is actually doing with musical instruments. Well, David, let's take one of the chemical elements. You can pick one. Uh, well, I'll do uh, part of the water vapor this spectrum is for water you. vapor. Okay. Now, to contrast it, could you potassium? Now, why is potassium a single note, and the water vapor Be was a series of is notes? a single atom whereas the molecule of water molecule contains three atoms, two hydrogens and one oxygen. And so it's more complicated, and it has a greater number of ways that it can actually resonate. Can I ask you for just another element? Yes. Can, okay, go, go just another a possible signature that we might be looking for. Perhaps sodium. Oh, so it's another single note. Yes. Um, what about methane? I have methane here for you. This is a little more complex. Just repeat how it is that you you got those notes as the signature for methane. And now methane is a gas that we are looking for on other planets. It would be a key gas to find. Working with Roy, I, I have these spectrograms which show the frequencies of light that are absorbed by these molecules and, and elements. And they come out as, as quite pronounced dips uh, in the intensity of light. We tag those dips. Uh, each one of those gets a uh, frequency, and that translates li directly into a, a note. And as you're hearing, the the simple tones come from, from elements that just have a, a single frequency that they absorb. But then for the molecules like water or methane, they're more complex, so they absorb over a whole range of frequencies, and we get this more yes. interesting sound. And you may wonder, why are we looking at water, sodium, potassium? Because those are the features that stand out. They're, they're the loudest voices in the spectrum, so to speak. We don't yet have very high resolution, high definition spectra of exoplanets. So we have to look for the features that stand out, and those are the ones that stand out the most. Water, surprisingly, is one of the easiest to find. So that's why it's in the mix. I'm wondering if you could project yourself in the future, if you could picture an astronomer or a scientist at work using data sonification, or really anyone, what is it that you picture? What is the possible practical application of this technique? Well, astronomers now have so much data that no single human being could analyze even with over an entire lifetime. I mean, I really think this is the way to go because NASA is very interested in and um, having the public work with data. So work with images, work with spectra, be able to understand what it means. I think that sonification helps us all work with data that would be difficult or tiring to look at any other way. And it, it really would enable the public to work more directly with data in a way that I think would be very interesting. Roy, have any scientists done this yet in the hunt for extrasolar planets? No, not yet. At the moment, scientists actually rely on computer models in analyzing. For, uh, for example, WASP-17b has a fairly simple spectrum, but it's still hard to determine what's there. That's an exoplanet. It's another large, giant, uh, giant planet. But what scientists do is they make thousands of models of what a planet might be like. They can actually calculate what its spectrum would look like for each model. And then they find the best fit to the data they have. And that's why we know there is water, sodium, and potassium in, in these planets, so because that, that stands out, and we see that in the models. Could you please play the signature of, um, of this planet, WASP-17b? Now, because David played a note that looked like it was a note that he played for potassium, does that mean that there's potassium on that planet? Yes. Yes, yes, we matched that one up. By the end of this project, I, I think I'll have a full periodic table of sounds in my <laughs> under my fingers. No, you're going to play uh, the signature from two exoplanets, right? That's right. That's H-A-T-P-1-B. 
it's one of those big giant planets like the others. <laughs> I mean, its mother would love it, I'm sure. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> That's WASP-17b again. And both of them had a flat. They did. Uh, that is sodium, that top note. Both of the planets have sodium. That's right. Can you play them again so we can hear them side by side? Hat B, which also sounds like hat P, but like we're happy doing this, but hat B, one B, and then also WASP-17b, uh, one after the other, so we can really hear them. To the jazz aficionados out there, we might recognize an augmented ninth, <laughs> which is the musical term. Um, but I think we all, we all get a, a kind of a, a jazzy element to that, that second one, especially. Mm. So the great thing about harmony is you can recognize it even if you can't describe it in any sort of technical way. <laughs> and I can see by the way you talk about this, and we can all hear the way that you describe it, that this really appeals to you. Well, absolutely. You know, music ha has so many ways to uh, engage with science and en engage with the world. And one of my favorite is the way that it can reveal things. You know, we, we talk about harmony as if harmony is only a musical phenomenon, but actually harmony occurs anywhere in nature uh, or in science where there are relationships between um, data points. You know, what we think of as a pleasant harmony is a simple ratio, one to two to three to four to five. Can you play the signature of Earth? Well, I have a, a bunch of different data sets for Earth. I mean, the, the one that I've been working with is, is very close to the water vapor spectrum because that's what we get. But it has this very pronounced note at the top, uh, which I, I'll try to play that one louder to show oxygen. Does that sound like oxygen to you, Roy? <laughs> it does now. In the case of Earth, of course, we see water and oxygen because that's what's in our atmosphere and that's what stands out. We'll end on one more example. Yeah. And in, in this example, you're going to show us how, how you turned a chord that was the chemical signature of water into a melody. That's right. So here's the chord again. I mean, in the spectrum, these are all simultaneous. I've been playing them going up in an arpeggio, but... Uh, you know, melody, we're used to this contour uh, moving uh, in different directions. But also, over the course of a melody, uh, I mean, melody always stems from the voice. We're looking for a, a rise and a fall so often. So those notes become... Those are the beginning notes of the piece that became Water Romanza. Yes, that's right. And can we finish this segment with having you play a little bit, not on this portable keyboard, but would you mind, could you go out there and, and play it on the grand piano for us? I'd be happy to. David Ibbett and Roy Gould, thank you so much for coming to this studio and helping us all feel a little more jazzed about the universe. It's been a real pleasure, Molly. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Molly. It's great to be here. Roy Gould is a researcher at the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. David Ibbett is a composer. Molly spoke with a duo in Somerville, Massachusetts. I like this idea of using music as a way to give you information about, you know, something like spectroscopy or science or something. I mean, that really goes back uh, hundreds of years when people talked about the music of the spheres and how all the planets were kind of in tune with one another. And that idea has sort of fallen a little bit by the wayside. But on the other hand, you know, when we look at these exoplanets, very often they go around when one planet goes around once, the second planet out goes around twice, and maybe the third one goes around four times. I mean, there really are, if you will, chords amongst the exoplanets, although I don't think you can hear them. Yeah, and it's lovely to think about these discoveries of exoplanets inspiring not just other scientists, but inspiring the artist community as well, as clearly they have with David Ibbett. It's a testament to just how big 
this discovery is that there are planets orbiting other stars outside of our solar system, and they have the potential to be homes for life other than our own. Yeah, the discovery of habitable exoplanets, music to his ears. Thank you to the There Should Be an Award for It. Production talents provided by senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I am executive producer Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David, and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the prevalence of planets. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer, Seth Shostak, and I'm hopeful we'll find some cosmic light pretty soon. Also, big thanks to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Nobel Efforts. If you want to hear more of Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org, and you will find a link to the guests that you heard as well. You may be listening to our radio show, but if you want BiPiSci to fit in with your awesome lifestyle, why not subscribe to the BiPiSci podcast so that you never miss an episode? And you'll find links on our website to the platforms that carry us, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, or Himalaya. 